we have another group of business leaders who are also engaged in sustainable activities, and we're going to explore with them how they approach the environmental aspects of their work. By, by way of background, I mean, environmental sustainability issues, to me, on a personal level, are very important. Just by way of a little bit of background, my undergraduate degree is actually in environmental geoscience, and then I received a, a master's degree while I was going to law school in environmental science as well. And so this is an issue that's, that's real to me, it's personal to me, and I bring those views to discussions around energy. The picture, the story in Nevada is, is absolutely incredible. If we look back to 2005, and often 2005 is used as a benchmark date for us to measure our carbon emissions in the state. Our carbon emissions from the energy sector in particular in the state of Nevada since 2005 are down over 50%. Tremendous. If we look at where our energy supply is coming from, as we sit here today, we only have one remaining coal-fired power plant that powers the, our customers in the state of Nevada. We have retired all of the coal-fired power plants that previously powered southern Nevada. There's one remaining plant in the north. That's currently scheduled to be retired by 2025. What have we done to replace that power? We have built thousands of megawatts of renewable energy. And more recently, that renewable energy is coupled with battery storage to ensure that that renewable resource is available during the peak time of day when, when we need it. For us, our customers' peak time of day is from 5 p.m. to about 9 p.m. And so we can utilize that solar energy later in the day with the benefits of battery storage. You know, another one I would mention that has helped encourage renewable energy development is the Renewable Portfolio Standard. That portfolio standard by 2030 has 50 percent of our energy coming from renewable resources. As we sit today, we actually just completed our filing for 2021 to show our compliance with the Renewable Portfolio Standard, and we achieved 31 percent, essentially, this past year. So we're already well on our way to achieving the 50% by, by 2030. More resources are scheduled to be built every single year between now and, and 2030. So it's an exciting future. We are on a good track. I am passionate about our environment and I'm passionate about how we approach sustainability. And I fundamentally believe that energy is a key part of that. Uh, in fact, I've dedicated, I would say, my career um, to talking about climate change, uh, even during uh, times when maybe it wasn't as popular. Um, I am an environmental economist by, by training, um, and uh, I pivoted that really to uh, energy and to focusing on how do we continue to drive clean energy innovation and create an affordable energy economy that works for everyone. I'm so happy to be part of this community. I'm super happy to be part of Southwest Gas. Um, we are looking at innovation across the board. I think my role coming in, this is the first time they've had this um, position, VP of Sustainability, is really to continue to build on the momentum that we have today um, to look for uh, clean energy solutions. So Doug mentioned renewable energy investment, and it doesn't uh, stop, I think, with solar and wind and batteries. Um, we have to look at things like hydrogen. What are the opportunities uh, for these molecular solutions that are going to provide uh, for affordability, reliability, resilience? So hydrogen is one, renewable natural gas in our transportation sector. How can we deliver cleaner solutions like compressed natural gas to complement um, the other solutions that we're providing? And Southwest is up to all of that and really making sure that we are driving those sustainable outcomes for our, our community and certainly for the state of Nevada. We've also been working very hard in anticipating what was happening. And really, if you look at this, we view these as climate change adaptation strategies. Uh, the infrastructure that we've put in, we've put in $1.3 billion worth of infrastructure in the form of a third intake project and a low lake level pumping station so that we could be prepared to be able to access our water resource when times were were occurring just like they are right now. And so a tremendous amount of forethought and, and, uh, and, and um, good approach went into, and commitment went into that as well. We find ourselves in a situation where we have 
2% of the overall allocation of Colorado River water, 2% of the, between us and the seven other seven, uh, seven states. And so um, we don't have a lot to work with, but what we need to do with this next tranche of uh, conservation initiatives is literally continue to be the most water efficient uh, locale in the world. And so I do think one important aspect of resilience is our ability as a state to sustain our own needs, to sustain our own economic development, to be able to stand on our own and to not have to necessarily be as reliant as we have in the past on the broader Western market. So yes, we have, uh, just for perspective on infrastructure, uh, we have approximately 6,500 miles worth of, uh, of water pipeline and, and uh, over 45 different pumping facilities that deliver water throughout the valley. And uh, that all adds into and helps to support what we look at from a resiliency standpoint. And really, it's resiliency and supply and re um, reliability of supply. We, as the Water Authority, put together a 50-year resource plan that takes into account all of our permanent resources, temporary resources that we have, banked resources as a result of our negotiations on the Colorado River, and then future resources, which are uh, still yet to be defined. It's a scenario-based approach that we look at, and the whole intent behind that is to make sure that we have a plan that, that accounts for the next 50 years. During that planning process is when we determined that based on the population growth that we were expecting over the next 50 years, and just to give you some perspective, we had approximately 20,000 new service connections just last year. So growing in Southern Nevada has not ebbed at this point. Uh, it's still very, very robust with about 50,000 new residents from what we understand. Um, it really necessitated a good look at our conservation program and our requirements to be able to deal with that in the face of climate change. Uh, we measure, as Tina had mentioned previously, uh, we measure our water efficiency basically in gallons per capita per day. It's a usage factor that we use. Currently, in, two, uh, in 2021, we were at 110 gallons per person per day. And that measurement's really important to us because in looking at the long-term demands, it was uh, a metric that we could use to benchmark. We expect over the next 50 years for that number of 110 gallons per capita per day to go to 123 gallons per capita per day simply because of climate. And there's lots of details that go into that calculation. So we're, as we look through this plan, we're already having to compensate for climate change over the next 50 years in, in this approach. In order for us to provide the uh, reliability of resource through that 50-year time period, we established a goal of 86 gallons per capita per day. And in that plan are multiple different initiatives that, are made, that make up that change from 123 down to 86. What so, needs to change? or what's happening in the utility space relative to uh, the, the future? For uh, Southwest Gas specifically, I, I would say that there has been legislation passed that has allowed us to advance um, energy diversity, which will be critical to increasing our self-sufficiency and also will contribute to resiliency. So SB uh, 151, which passed in 2015, has allowed us to expand um, our system uh, upon you know customer interest and a desire to do that in places like uh, Mesquite uh, where they didn't have um, access to natural gas previously and the expansion of our system there and uh, providing services has had a significant and will have a significant reduction uh, in CO2 emissions and it's also providing uh, for economic outcomes by lowering cost as well as providing redundancy in the energy system. So I think that that redundancy is really critical and we're also looking uh, for expansion and, uh, and working with Spring Creek presently uh, to do that as well. So I think really important as we look holistically around how we create redundancy uh, in our energy systems and ensure that we have the infrastructure that's gonna be able to deliver those solutions. Policy, as many of us are, are probably aware, has been a huge driver of the renewable energy market as it exists today. Um, we're fortunate uh, here in Nevada um, that we have policies um, that have supported 
um, development of alternative uh, molecular energy solutions like renewable natural gas. So um, the Southwest has been uh, fortunate to be able to expand uh, in the renewable natural gas space. And what you can do is you're essentially taking uh, methane from organic processes. And methane, as many of us know, is a huge contributor uh, to global warming, even though it exists in the environment uh, for less time uh, than CO2, it has a bigger impact. So if you can pull that methane out from those organic uh, processes, uh, clean it up, and then put it into a gas pipeline, then you can provide a clean energy solution, really a win-win from production to consumption. So Going like full, like full circle from the other conversations that we had earlier today about the social metrics that are part of sustainability, I love the Water Authority, Las Vegas Valley Water District, and Envy Energy. You guys think so far ahead, and that kind of came up earlier. It's like, who's looking decades ahead, right? Well, you guys certainly are. Like, the Water Authority definitely is, right? They've, they have been for 50 years. Um, I've thought about this. The nonprofits that are most successful have easy measure, or like, not easy, but consolidated metrics, right? So three square, they can measure their success and pounds of food distributed to food pantries, right? It's like money management, it's a good surrogate for a bunch of other things that are working or not. Uh, you guys could do acre feet of water, right? Or cubic feet of gas or BTUs or whatever, however you want to measure it. It's like a single measurement. I, what, what I was hoping to hear today, and what actually I think I heard was that as a community coming together on those social measurements, is there inspiration that those of us that are working in the social sectors can find for like that kind of like 30 year out, but 30 years out, but looking at um, victims of sexual exploitation um, or, or homelessness or affordable housing, like you guys do your thing so well, right? Can you help us find solutions and, or just, Maybe just react to that. Like, where, where do we find solutions and things that are less less easily measured? Tough question. I mean, incredibly tough, but important question. Um, maybe we can talk a little bit about some of the partnerships that you've undertaken over the years to try to deal with quality because these are quality of life issues. This is what the community uh, really thinks about when it comes to sustainability uh, beyond you know, the resource conversation that we're having. So what, what, what are you thinking? I, w I would just very briefly say part of, part of the issue that we have, when we first started in 2002, people didn't understand what a water crisis was. They didn't understand how much uh, turf mattered with respect to its removal. They didn't understand what they could do and what their place in, in that situation was. And so as you are trying to onboard uh, folks I think education is just such a huge opportunity to be able to start any of these longer term initiatives because you can't get people to become passionate about things that they don't even understand. And that would be the, that would be the um, kind of the initial point that I would say that would link all of us together is an understanding of what it is that surrounds them that's in their backyard and the problems that are being faced because let's face it, we would not be able to be where we are today with respect to um, how the community has grown and responded if people didn't understand that there was a problem and understood enough that, uh, of, of the solutions that, to be able to be a part of the solution.